Mark Twain told us that he never made the mistake of letting schooling get in the way of his education. And we immediately know what he means, and we almost universally agree with it. But let's be honest, we're nerds. It's a Saturday, you're inside in a dark room. <laughs> we think this is obviously true of us, because we number ourselves among the autodidacts. Sure, we've, we've had all sorts of benefits. Uh, we live in a knowledge and data saturated age. Uh, most people in this room have been through lots and lots of schooling on the old bubble charts when you're filling out demographic data there are, There's a 12 and a 14 and a 16 and many of you need to write in the 24 or 26 years you've spent in school We're an odd group assembled here on a Saturday. We like TED talks for a reason But we think we believe that that Twainian insight is true of everybody until we start thinking about our neighbors when you start thinking about the kids in your neighborhood, and when you start thinking about the worries you have about them, the worries that I have about them, we all of a sudden passively begin to assume that the formalization and the bureaucratization of education is obviously a good. Whatever comes next must be more education because people have suffered and they lack knowledge, they lack information, and they would be better off if only there were more formal bureaucratic structures around higher education. Governors across the country passively believe this right now. I believe 41 of 50 governors currently have what's called a P-16 initiative. There was a time years ago when all state government bureaucracies around education were called K-12 bureaucracies. We now add a P for pre-K on the front end because there's tons of data that shows that early childhood reading is a, an unimaginable good. Of course, in the great American success stories of people who've been underprivileged, people do amazing things as outliers. But if you took two big groups, people who know how to read when they get to kindergarten and people who don't know how to read when they get to kindergarten and you come and check back in with them in sixth grade and ninth grade and 12th grade once they've graduated and gone off to college or to first jobs, the sets of those who knew how to read when they got to kindergarten and those who didn't almost change not at all. The 16 side of the equation is a lot more dubious from where I sit. P16 is an attempt to create a new idea, a language of grade 13, grade 14, grade 15, grade 16, a sort of universality about going on beyond age 18. And I recognize that what motivates the governors to do this is an obvious recognition of the crisis of work uh, for 18 and 19 and 20 year olds in the world. And yet the passivity of saying grade 13 uh, implies that what we believed was true when we said at the beginning of this that Twain spoke for us when we didn't allow schooling to get in the way of our education, somehow it's not true of others. We can just passively move forward uh, being spoon-fed more and more information and we think that it's a good. That's a strange assumption to have. Higher education is in crisis. There's not one crisis in higher education. There are many, many, many. I want to unpack uh, four of them a little bit today, uh, but I want to start with one of the uh, directives you get when you are uh, recruited or signed up to give a TED Talk. I'm a TED Talk fan, uh, as are all of you, uh, but I've never given one before, so I know what feels similar about all of these talks, but I didn't know there was sort of an unwritten uh, Ten Commandments of TED Talks, and one of them is that you're supposed to be vulnerable, uh, and you're supposed to admit things that you're anxious or insecure about, so I'll admit that I'm scared to death about 17-year-olds in our country. And I'm scared to admit that I'm scared uh, because it sounds sort of patrician or elitist to say that we're scared about what's happening among 17-year-olds in our land. And it's really not 17, it's 14 or 16 or 18 or 20. Um, but I look at the 17-year-olds, I'm young, I'm 41, um, but 23 years ago when I went off to college, I had walked beans for two years, detasseled corn for four years, sort of fibbed about my age to get into Memorial Stadium to sell pop at Husker Games well before I was old enough to actually be working. I had sold pop at Husker Games for eight years. I'd lifeguarded for three years. It's a much better environment than detasseling corn when you want to meet girls when you're 15. <laughs> I'd worked a lot by the time I went off to school at age 18. The kids who come into our college, um, by and large, haven't ever really done any real work. They may have dipped ice cream for a month or two at the mall one summer, but fundamentally, 17-year-old and 18-year-old kids going off to school right now have never really worked, and it scares me to death. 
And so what I'd like to do, I have a, a, a modest uh, set of goals for our 12-ish minutes together today. Number one, I want to map five different crises in or around higher education. Four of them are talked about by experts, but it's the fifth one that keeps me up at night. I want to map five crises around higher education. Number two, I want to persuade you um, that the one that keeps me up at night is the one that should keep you up at night. They all matter. Um, they're important problems in higher education. And the institutional architecture and institutional landscape of 18 to 22 year olds coming of age, there are big problems. All five of these matter, but I want to persuade you that one is far more important than the other. And the one that's more important is the one that starts with the needs of students, not with the failures or tweaks uh, in the institutional landscape of higher ed institutions themselves. And the one that matters is also the one that doesn't have any obvious advocates. There's no clear constituency for the 17 year olds. When I say I'm scared for the 17 year olds and I'm scared about being scared for the 17 year olds, I'm not chiefly beating them up. I'm not even precisely beating up their parents and I'm not really making precisely political or policy related comments. When you're a fan of TED Talks, you sort of, I think, mostly believe that politics is downstream from culture and culture is downstream from deliberate conversation and ideas. So I don't mean to point a finger of blame at anyone in particular, but I do believe that the insiders and the experts, the people who sort of run the institutions of higher education today, are unlikely to fix the problems that we have. We need to have a much broader conversation because the historical moment we sat at, sit at, and I'm a historian by training, so it scares me to say something like this, but I think is historically unprecedented. The crisis of 17-year-old or 14-year-old or 21-year-old, the crisis of adolescent work has really never happened before in human history. So when I ask the question, what is four years good for? If you could live it again, if you could go back and be 18 and have four years of leisure, four years of time, and a hundred plus thousand dollars of money, how would you spend it? <laughs> that conversation is a question about who we are as people. That conversation ultimately relates to our mortality. It relates to what we want for our kids, and I submit that it should relate for what, to what we want for all other kids in our neighborhood and in our society and in our republic. I'm not making any precisely political or policy comments today, um, but I do want to challenge us to open our minds and think more creatively about this 18 to 22 year old moment. Because what we're doing right now is interesting, that is higher education is panicking about things that are broken. Higher education recognizes that there is going to be an electronic revolution in this space and things are going to be remade in the higher ed landscape. But most of the conversations are dominated by people who are putting institutions first rather than people who are putting first 18 to 22 year old kids. So my three goals to restate, one, I want to map five crises. Number two, I want to persuade you that the one that has no constituency and no advocates and the one that we're talking about the least is the most important. And third, I want to propose a really simple metric for how you would decide whether or not we're making progress on that. And it's a metric as goofy as if you sit at a graduation in May of next year and you look at 22 year old kids walking across the stage to get a diploma or to get a certificate or to get some sort of um, other uh, societal validation of time that they've spent well and something that they've actually accomplished. When you cross that line and watch them, could you ask a curiosity question about them that is like the curiosity question you immediately apply to yourselves or that Twain spoke for all of us? And it's a question like, do I believe that he or she will want to read a book on their own next year when nobody else required it? It's a pretty basic question, but if we don't think that the people that are being turned out of our higher ed institutions are curious, if we don't think the people being turned out of those institutions believe they can make a future, then I think we're on the precipice of a societal decline, and it's a serious crisis, much greater than the economics, the costs, uh, the metrics of accountability and learning assessment that higher education is mostly talking about. So let me begin uh, by mapping the five crises, four of which are the ones already being talked about. We have a cost crisis. We have a preparedness crisis. We have a student learnings crisis, and we have an institutional architecture crisis because there's an e-revolution coming to this space that's akin to what's happened in all other knowledge mediation industries and been delayed in higher education for a bunch of reasons about accreditation and barriers to entry. I'll start at preparedness. The students that arrive at the front door of colleges are not ready, ready for college. 
according to the ACT, the, the, in the Midwest, the preparatory tests that we use for college admissions, only about 30% of test takers, and the test takers are roughly the same community as those planning to go to college. A huge number of our high school juniors and seniors are not taking the test because they don't even think they're bound or able to go on to the next level of education. <laughs> Among test takers, the ACT believes something like 30% of kids are prepared for college level work. Something like 12% of Latino and Latina test takers in the Midwest are prepared for college level work and it's the fastest growing demographic of students. Something like 5% of African American test takers are ready for college level work. This is a crisis that cannot be overstated. You can't really be too hyperbolic about the fact that by different demographic groups, we're looking at five to 30% of kids ready to do college level work when they get there. Or to say it in a less quantifiable way, my wife teaches freshmen at our institution, and she tells me how bad freshman writing is, and I think she's exaggerating, and so then I sneak over when she's out of the room since we've just argued about it, and I look in her manila folder of papers that came in this week, and students at institution after institution, big and small, public and private, liberal arts and uh, vocational tech minded, um, students are not ready to write at a college level. And it isn't just about the social media environment that they're living in. It isn't just about grammar and syntax. It's about the fuzziness of what's going on inside their heads. You move from preparedness to costs. One of the reasons colleges will tell you that they have unsustainable costs is because they're arriving with, at their front door, they're having arrived so many students that are unprepared to do college level work that the freshman year at most institutions is mostly remedial. That's partly true. Um, and yet, if you look at the larger picture of costs in higher education, this is an institutional sector in crisis. Corrected for inflation, higher education costs have grown 42% beyond inflation in the last 10 years and 147% beyond inflation in the last 30 years. The only sector that even compares to being this broken is healthcare. And we know that we're in the midst of a national conversation about the unsustainability of healthcare costs, quality, and access, and uninsurance. But that's only the one-year numbers. Those are, those are uh, tuition and room and board numbers corrected by uh, overinflation to 147% over the last 30 years. But that's not telling you how many years students are in school. At many public institutions across the United States now, the four-year degree is not even a five-year degree. Average time to degree is ticking beyond five years at many institutions. Who thinks you're getting a five and a half or six-year education in those five and a half or six years? And so students are coming out with more, more student loan debt in the US, cumulatively now, than credit card debt. 53% of college graduates under the age of 25 in the United States are either entirely unemployed or employed in a sector that requires no higher education. 51% of our college graduates under age of uh, 25. 84% of employers believe that the students that they're hiring are not fit for their jobs. And so there are all sorts of ways that we think about offshoring jobs, retaining people longer, building out different sort of consulting arrangements in firms instead of hiring people that are 22 to 25 years old who just finished a college education that was about more than preparing them for their first job, but it surely shouldn't have been about less. And so we have a crisis of cost. We have a crisis of student learning in the country. According to Academically Adrift, the single best uh, book on this topic, if you're interested in, in digging deeper, according to Academically Adrift, fully 45% of college students learn nothing from the fall of their freshman year to the fall of their junior year. 45% have no measurable intellectual improvement or disciplinary acquisition of knowledge in their first two years of school. And another 25% learn so little you could argue it's just the opportunity cost of having gone from 18 to 20 years old. <laughs> Managing the freshman 15, buzz management, learning to do laundry, uh, figuring out the hours of the dining hall because mom's not there to be open all hours. Something like 70% of students are gaining nothing by being in college for the first two years. We have a student learning crisis and we're requiring far too little of our students. Fully one third of college students in the United States are not involved in a single class that requires 40 hours a week, or sorry, uh, 40 pages a week of reading. They don't have a single class that requires them to read 40 pages. 
half of students are not in a single class that requires them to write 20 pages in a semester. And so we get to a place where as students are coming out of higher education, the time that they have spent there has had so little effect on their experience that we have to beg fundamental questions, not just about what is happening in our schools. We know about the teaching research divide and how faculty are rewarded for doing things that aren't often aligned with what students need, and that's the main reason outside the hard sciences that most of the public agrees in making the investments that we make in higher education. And so we have a preparedness crisis on the front end, we have a cost crisis inside the institution, and we have a student learning crisis that we can't demonstrate what's actually happening while they're there, despite the ballooning costs. The fourth crisis is a little more interesting because there's some opportunity in it. Uh, those last three crises are just about societal and educational sector underperformance. The fourth crisis isn't really a crisis for all of us. The fourth crisis is just a crisis for incumbents, and that is that sector after sector over the last 20 years in the United States has been going through IT revolutions, and it's mostly been remaking uh, the extant incumbents. And so this is a crisis if you sit on a board, uh, or if you're on a faculty senate, or if you're an academic administrator at a college or university, but the fact that by analogy, every other sector that's like higher education, knowledge mediation, has been blown up since the mid-1990s, that's not necessarily a societal crisis, um, but it definitely does lead to a different, more kind of acute focus on what's happening in this sector. Travel agencies, stock brokerage, music publishing, book publishing, print journalism, broadcast, Anything that used to be about getting information from one person to another used to have a lot of intermediaries in them, and IT is disintermediating and digitizing and unbundling and hybridizing many of these sectors and creating all sorts of interesting things. We don't have time here in our limited minutes together to think about all the analogies, but in travel agency or in stock brokerage, we know that two things happen. There was a time in the early 1990s when there were 45,000 corner store travel agents in America, and we used to think that the travel agent taught us things we couldn't figure out on our own, when really most of what they were paid for was the transaction to just get us what was then a papered ticket and became a paperless ticket, and now what Travelocity and Orbitz and Expedia does meets our needs in a far more efficient way, unless you're gonna go on a safari to a certain part of uh, Kruger National Park and uh, Northeast uh, South Africa, and you don't know anything about how to get there, then you'll pay your travel agent, but you wanna pay fees for things that are actually knowledge, not merely transactional. Inside higher education, there are many of those bundles. Many of those things will be unbundled, and we'll start to pay for value-added tasks, and many things, sort of like TEDx, will ultimately, um, sorry to be distracted, the clock hasn't worked the whole time, Bryce, so sorry to have drifted, but if you could flag me with your fingers. <laughs> um, so I, I wanna say that those four crises are the crises of the experts. The crises of the experts are the preparedness, the, um, the cost, the actual academic learning and the fact that many incumbents are gonna be disintermediated. Colleges and universities, we have 2,200 of them in the US, 1,700 of them are small. Wall Street bond analysts tell you that probably half of them cease to exist in the next decade. They cease to exist because you're gonna have declining revenue per customer when there's an e-revolution in this space and it's gonna be harder at less revenue or per customer per student, it's gonna be less, more difficult to cover your overhead and the scale of higher education is probably gonna become much larger. I think, while that's interesting to me as a business guy who's done a lot of turnaround projects, I think that's fascinating from an institutional architecture standpoint, from a corporate or not-for-profit strategy standpoint, but from an actual who are the 17-year-old standpoint, I have great panic about this moment because I think what comes next is a world where we are passively deciding as a society uh, to push more 18-year-olds into higher ed because we don't know what else to do with them. 10 years ago in Nebraska, 63% of kids when they graduated high school went to college as their next step. Ten, that was 10 years ago, 63% tried college. Last year, 71% tried college. Stated differently, fully a quarter of the formerly job-seeking market of high school graduates has evaporated in only 10 years. Well, guess what? There are no more college graduates in the region now per year than there were 10 years ago. All we're doing is passively shuffling 18-year-olds into freshman year of college because we don't know what else to do with them, not because we think these institutions are actually performing and serving them well. What is really happening, and what is a historically scary thing to admit, is that in the history of the world, we've only had four basic kinds of economies. 
We've had agrarian, uh, we've had uh, hunter-gatherers, we've had settled agrarian farmers, we've had manufacturing economies, and now we're shifting into a knowledge or an information economy. We don't have any great written records of what happened at the dislocation between uh, traveling um, hunter-gatherers and the settling of farms, but we know what a lot about what happened between uh, more efficient agriculture, uh, meaning that we needed less labor, and the rise of large tools or factories. From 1870 to 1920, urbanization, industrialization, immigration created the greatest societal upheavals we'd seen in hundreds of years in Western society. As people moved in unprecedented numbers to cities, and as they got to those cities, they had to come up with new social norms and new social arrangements, and they had to find new kinds of jobs and be trained in new ways. We're going through something similar right now without really acknowledging what's happening. We're shifting from mostly manufacturing economy jobs where most 18-year-olds used to be competent to add value in the world, to put food on the table, and to serve their neighbor by working with their hands. We're moving to a world where there's almost no work for 18-year-olds. And they haven't had work experiences. And so we have right now a functional unemployment rate among high school, young high school dropouts of 49%. We have an unemployment rate among young, merely high school graduates, people who've done no college, of 34%. And so what we are doing is we are taking a higher ed sector that's already in crisis, and we are allowing more and more students to drift into it because we don't know what to do with them. We need to have a different kind of conversation. We need to have a conversation that recognizes that a huge part of what America has always meant has been the American work ethic and an American dream that said that people who believed that they could work hard and make a future and make a difference could work hard and they could make a future and then they could make a difference because they had been around work. What's increasingly happening in our communities and particularly in underprivileged communities is kids have never actually done work or been around work. And we're saying from the bottom up where we don't know what to do with the kids and from the higher ed institutional perspective of these institutions aren't getting the right kinds of kids in, they don't know how to do it in an efficient way, we don't know how to serve them in a way that demonstrates that they're actually learning, we should instead just passively push more into these institutions. I would submit to you that these are interesting times with great opportunity. But these interesting times with great opportunity are going to require a whole new way of thinking creatively about the institutional landscape of coming of age. Sociologists can tell you that over millennia, the things that we think of that define the difference between a kid and an adult, um, physical maturation, first uh, re reproduction, first home leaving, first establishment of an independent household, cessation of schooling, first job, first job that pays enough to put enough food in, on the table that you're no longer reliant upon someone else. These markers of adulthood, these markers of independence, we tend to passively think they've always happened in the same order until, like the great video that preceded us, uh, you realize that language and lenses to look at the block versus the street, they've changed all throughout human history. The markers of in an extended family, if you begin to reproduce and marry your spouse but still live in your parents' household, versus, as we do, moving out long before you typically reproduce. The world is changing, but the world is changing in one way that it has never changed before, which is the kids that are becoming adults haven't been around work, and the institutions that we're expecting to teach them how to work don't have any mandate to know how to teach them how to work. And one of the great ways to kick off a day at a TED Talk is by praising the generalists, because you all, as the generalists, must participate in this conversation. Politics is downstream from culture. Culture is downstream from ideas. And we have a crisis of adolescent work in the country, and we will not passively solve it by moving all of our adolescents into higher education institutions unless we also rethink and rebuild and differentiate these institutions in a new way. Thank you.